Let's move forward with the next part of our program, our panel discussion that will provide some perspective on how the commercial real estate industry outside of Wisconsin views the Milwaukee market and how the city is working to take advantage of development opportunities. Our panelists include, and as I call your name, please come up, uh, first of all, Lafayette Crump, the Commissioner of Milwaukee's Department of City Development. He has been in the position since 2020 and has been busy working to facilitate numerous development projects in the city, including several on the west side of, of downtown, hot spot in town right now. Tony Lindsay is involved in one of those projects on the west side of downtown. He is the principal of asset management for Chicago-based Northwells Capital, which is the owner of the Hub 640 building downtown, where Pfizer will move its corporate headquarters and also where Kohl's plans to open a store on the ground floor. Uh, we also have Thomas Darcy, Senior Managing Director for Houston-based Heinz. He works out of the firm's Chicago office. Heinz is building a 31-story apartment tower in the Third Ward. It'll be clearly the tallest building in the neighborhood once it's complete. And then we have uh, Jeff Castleman uh, returning, uh, also joined the, the panel. Once again, he's partner and senior VP for CRG, works out of the firm's Chicago office, joined the company in 2019, previously was executive managing director and national industrial practice group leader for Newmark Knight, Cat, Knight Frank. The moderator for the panel is Andy Hunt, vice director for the Center for Real Estate at Marquette University. We're extremely grateful for the partnership we have with Marquette's real estate program to put together this event, and Andy has been tremendously helpful. Thank you, Andy, and with that, I turn it over to you. The purpose of this panel is going to be a little bit more focused on looking from the outside in what we're seeing in other markets, how they relate to us here in Milwaukee. We've looked at some really big trends, thanks to Jeffrey. Unbelievable presentation. Thank you again. Now we're going to talk a little bit more specific to real estate uh, and, and how that might be impacting those of us in this room today. So uh, we already had the uh, introduction of our panelists, but uh, just as a reminder, um, we've got so Jeffrey here, uh, the futurist. Also an industrial specialist, so we'll hear a little bit more about that. And um, even though he, he might just be a little bit less smart, slightly less smarter than, um, than uh, James Whitaker, he's way nicer. So Jeffrey, thanks for having me, for being bombs. here. <laughs> Tom Darcy, uh, uh, Senior Managing Director of Heinz. Um, and you'll know him for the Northwestern Mutual Tower 777 and now the new project in the Third Wards. We'll talk about that. Uh, Tony Lindsay, uh, Chicago-based, owners of Hub 640. Um, and uh, has won uh, two lotteries in the last year with uh, five serving Coles. So, luckiest guy in the room. Um, it's hard work too, Tony. I know. Don't let me. Don't let me downplay it too much. And then, of course, the man, the myth, the legend, Lafayette Crump, Milwaukee native, deal maker, man of the people, and and father of a newborn. He looks great, doesn't he? Yeah. Congrats again, Lafayette. Um, let's kick it off with you. So we want to start off with just a little bit of a, a, a state of the state. What's going on at DCD? Uh, talk to us a little bit about your time there has been crazy. Uh, talk about coming in in COVID. Talk about you know coming in after uh, after a legend that had been there for a long time in his own right. And uh, yet you've you've definitely made a splash, my friend. Um, tell us about what's going on in DCD and and you know what what we should know about in the audience. Sure. Thanks, Andy. And uh, good morning, everyone. I'm, I'm sure you can tell uh, <laughs> by the voice that, that sleep is coming at a premium right now. Uh, so, so thank you for that built-in built excuse you, you've offered there. Uh, and I, I see the countdown clock. So I've got 28 minutes. Is that right? Is that uh, OK? All right. Um, 27. OK. All right. Um, but but yeah, it, uh, you know I've got a few prepared remarks here. But you know starting with that um, that idea of starting during COVID uh, was such an interesting time to to get started. Um, you know, I told people uh, that it felt like I started the the gig about two or three different times. You know I started when we were only doing things uh, you know via our screens, and um, you know it was kind of kind of easy to just sit in the office and uh, either or home and, and, and take calls or, or be on the screen, and then uh, you know and accept all the various uh, boards and appointments and easy to, to take all of those meetings and then all of a sudden people want you to show up everywhere and it uh, got it got a little bit harder to, to be everywhere at once and to um, you know continue to find time to not just do the things that that people were asking of me whether that be people internal to the city or external but also finding time to think about what we wanted to do and kind of re-envision uh, the work uh, that DCD does and you know that, that continues to be a struggle I'm sure everyone out 
out here can relate, uh, it'd be great to have more time uh, to think about how you're going to do things versus just doing them and doing them. So it'd be great when the singularity comes and we can just turn all that over to our robot overlords. Um, so. <laughs> Thank you for that. Very, very comforting. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it is. Uh, it is really great to be here amongst um, you know a number of friends whom I admire and um, you know others who I don't know well, but really admire the work that you do from afar. You make Milwaukee stronger. You, you make it better every day, and I appreciate the work uh, that you all do. Um, you know, it's a city that is experiencing kind of uh, once in a generation development. And I, I did take a look at um, the survey results and you know, it, it's interesting seeing um, you know, the, the optimism and how it ebbs and flows, but truly you know, the, the development that we've seen over the last several years and that's uh, on the books right now is, is really impressive. Uh, it's development that's reshaping our skyline. It's creating more dense business and residential districts, also providing a, a lot of new opportunities uh, for civic amenities, for transit, uh, for neighborhood growth, for connections between our neighborhoods, which I think is something really important for us to, to think about in the city, about how we connect our downtown to the surrounding neighborhoods, and, and then furthermore, how we correct, connect those neighborhoods outward, and then connect the city to its, uh, its, its uh, inner ring suburbs. You know, I'm really proud that our department, the Department of City Development, is so involved in um, you know, the majority of the conversations that are happening uh, regarding creating new commercial real estate development in the city. Um, you know, we, we get to help shape what happens. We lay the foundation for it to succeed and, you know, in a lot of cases, help projects get across the finish line. And it's a privilege that we don't take lightly. Um, you know, we've worked with uh, two of my co-panelists here to help facilitate the, their uh, respective projects and looking forward to hearing more about those. And, and Andy, I'm glad you amended and said it was more than just a lottery. It's really hard work. I'm sure Tony can chat a little bit about that. Uh, but, you know, pro projects and deals don't just happen as, as you all well know. Um, you know, later today, uh, the tax and criminal financing package for Fiserv is going to go before the Redevelopment Authority. Um, you know, this is a project uh, that we've been working on for, for some time, um, you know, and it's going to help ensure that, you know, this really phenomenal economic development opportunity uh, becomes a reality in, uh, in Milwaukee's West Town in our central business district. And it is also going to provide for public infrastructure. Um, you know, the improvements that are going to happen because this project occurs uh, are going to have a real impact on that surrounding area. Um, so really looking forward to hearing Tony speak a little bit more about that uh, and as well as hearing uh, uh, from Tom about, uh, about their project. We worked with Heinz on uh, their ongoing development at, uh, at Water in St. Paul, um, and Heinz, like North Wells, you know, these are companies that were attracted to Milwaukee to work on previous projects, found a great group of partners here, a great workforce, and, you know, I like to think um, a pretty amenable city government, um, and continue to do great things here. Uh, that's, that's something for us to be proud of, that when we attract uh, others to come into Milwaukee and get work done, that they see a really viable opportunity to do more of it. Uh, you know, and here's the bottom line. The Department of City Development, you know, uh, under my leadership, under the, our overarching leadership of Mayor Johnson, um, you know, his direction and working in conjunction with our partners at the council, um, external partners, including all of you, uh, we're focused on identifying opportunities and solutions opportunities and solutions that, you know, boost development and grow the economy. Really pleased at our role in, um, you know, securing a lot of these major developments. It, that makes sense for our city, but there are also quite a few other developments that we spend a lot of time working on uh, that, that get less coverage, but are, that are no less important. You know, pursuing and facilitating that economic development, uh, it's a real top priority for us at DCD. And, you know, whether we're talking about the Milwaukee tool come in and all the other activity in West Town, the continued rise of the couture, uh, you know, up by the ground, but also our progress in Bronzeville and uh, along King Drive, Menominee Valley, the Harbor District, near West Side, Century City, um, you know, really throughout the city, all of these areas that are incredibly important to us. You know, we're committed to administering commercial corridor grants as well, um, you know, for small businesses, helping to make the improvements that they need uh, and repairs for, for properties throughout the city. I see I've got 46 minutes now. This is great. It's just getting longer. Um, you know, we're advancing the sale of... Uh, 
city-owned real estate, you know, commercial and residential, um, you know, put properties back into productive use. Um, you know, so crucial that as we redevelop, that we make sure that we don't just have these blind spots in the city. You know, we've got a, a really robust effort to impact affordable housing um, using ARPA dollars and the Homes MKE initiative, renovating 150 properties, a uh, number of home ownership and home improvement programs as well, uh, working with the Community Development Alliance to focus uh, on affordable housing. We're just doing massive, massive work uh, on changing the affordable housing landscape uh, and equitable home ownership in the city. Um, our planning staff, completing the Bayview plan uh, right now, as well as the Connecting MKE Downtown 2040 plan, um, which is gonna provide this roadmap for doubling the residential population downtown, which is really gonna be important if we get to a million, to get to a million residents, which is a, a goal that uh, the, the mayor and I share. Um, you know, really just trying to make the core of our city more walkable, more bikeable, improving our public streets and other public spaces, and reinforcing downtown as the cultural anchor, not just of our city, but of our region. Um, you know, one other thing I want to mention is that in doing all of this work, uh, the department really tries to apply an equity lens. Um, and I'm proud that we've been a leader with respect to that work within the city, uh, within city government. Uh, and that equity focus ensures that every neighborhood investment that we deploy, uh, you know, every development proposal that we uh, either help generate or, or work with outside partners with, uh, every planning effort, every housing program, every small business support initiative, that, that all of that reaches residents and businesses in all corners of the city, and particularly those who are uh, kind of historically disenfranchised, um, you know, because of entrenched racial or other biases. Uh, you know, and as we infuse this economic activity throughout the city, um, you know, we're not just redeveloping and replacing what came before. You know, we also want to grow. We want to improve. We want to expand and set new standards uh, for who's winning economically and what Milwaukee can look like and what it can be. Uh, you know, and together we're, we're just going to try to create the, the vibrant city that we all know Milwaukee can be and one that's very attractive from the outside looking in. Wow. Thank you, Lafayette, for the transition. <laughs> It, 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 it excites me to have a conversation in a room like this. This is one of my favorite events of the year. I say that every year when I'm here. I, I know that so many of you feel exactly the same way. We calendar this event and we can sit here now and be really excited that we had a presentation like we had uh, from Jeffrey, thinking so into the future, but here as leaders of this community, we're listening to those things. Now we have leaders like Lafayette who are, who are experiencing this presentation and hearing it and implementing it as well. So we can start to really make that change within our own community. And that's one of the things that you're gonna start to hear uh, from all of our, the pre-work that we did for this panel is there's a lot of cutting edge stuff that's going on that these gentlemen are leading um, here, and, and I'm excited about that. So let's lay that foundation a little bit more for this, this theme of outside looking in, um, and, uh, and have a little bit of background on some of the companies that are represented here. Um, Tony, tell us a little bit more about uh, North Wales Capital, um, and you're more of a regional located, you know, headed, headquartered in Chicago, the asset classes you work on, things like that. Yeah, as you said, headquartered in Chicago, really kind of focused on adaptive reuse uh, properties. We have a large uh, area of property in River North. We have about a million square feet of office space there, really in that kind of B plus uh, asset class and very similar to Hub 640 where we've bought them, renovated them and occupied them with commercial office. Perfect, thank you, Tony and Tom. Uh, moving on to Heinz, Heinz very national. Uh, footprint uh, based out of Texas, um, big regional office though that, uh, that you're kind of you work with. Tell us a little bit more about Heinz as a, as a global, and then you know the, your region, what you've been working on. Sure. So we are a relatively large uh, developer and acquirer uh, of all, really all the food groups. Now uh, we started off historically as a major high-rise developer in the urban core, and over the years have expanded into. Um, all of the, I call them all the food groups, so industrial, uh, retail, multifamily, et cetera. Um, the way we're organized in the U.S. is really by region. So we have five regions. Geographically, I'm in the Midwest region, and so that is my, my practice group. And even though I'm office in Chicago, most of my projects are outside of Chicago. I've probably done something in just about every top 20 Midwest city, probably except Minneapolis. And uh, principally, I started in the office side, and now most of what I'm doing is multifamily 
because it's easier. <laughs> Sometimes. So, uh, Jeffrey, not only are you one of the smartest people in the room, you also are, are in industrial real estate, which I think those two things are probably tied together. Um, tell us a little bit more about CRG uh, if, for those in the audience that don't, don't know sure. about the work that you guys do. Sure. So, CRG is part of the Clayco construction, uh, Clayco Enterprises um, line of businesses. Clayco is about a five and a half, almost six billion dollar uh, USA only uh, third party commercial general contractor. There are five main business lines under that umbrella. CRG, which is a development entity, and we develop um, different asset classes around the United States. A lot of industrial and a lot of multifamily, equal pipelines of both. We do data centers, we do office, we do mixed use, but there's been less of that to do lately. Um, we also have an architectural and design company called LJC. We've got Clayco Construction. We've got a concrete, uh, tilt-up concrete company. Most of their work is in different climate zones, right? The, the seasonality for, for tilt-up versus precast in the, in the upper Midwest is a little bit different. Um, it's called CSI, Concrete Specialties. Uh, and then we have a curtain wall company called Ventana. Um, and those five companies all go to market separately, but you can imagine we're always trying to find combinations and projects and economies and verticality uh, where we can bring that together. So that's, that's CRG and Clayco. And no, no deals in Wisconsin yet, you said, but not, uh, not, not for not trying. You guys are looking, right? We, we have been looking. Um, we look from, from you know, Kenosha and the, the Wisconsin uh, borderline with Illinois all the way up north of, of Milwaukee. Uh, we are actively doing a multifamily project in Madison right now, um, so it's, it's too soon to announce it. But, you know, we, we are coming to uh, Wisconsin. Uh, we've worked with the airport, um, or I shouldn't say work with, we've looked at airport properties. We think that could be an interesting opportunity in this market. Um, we'll, we'll find the right deal. We just haven't found it yet. We love having you here, so thank you. So let's let's dive in a little bit and start with the let's start with the challenges, right? What, what are we what are we facing out there in the headwinds in our in our market? Um, and, and again, as much as we want to, uh, as much as we can, to compare what we're seeing in other markets back to Milwaukee. So, Tom, I'm going to go to you first. Uh, tell us a little bit more about you know between these challenges with inflation, and construction costs, supply chains, uh, capital markets, labor. Um, what are the biggest challenges that you're seeing? Um, and let's start with other markets, and then let's relate that back to what you're seeing here in Milwaukee as well. Sure. Well, I, I can say everything I'm seeing here or there is 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 crossed. I mean, it, it's the same problems really in all the markets or the same challenges. I don't think there's really anything unique to Milwaukee or to Omaha or Oklahoma City or Cleveland. It's the same challenge. I, I would say, you know, on the inflationary front, um, you know, I guess our view on it, is that it's it's here to stay, but it's I don't think it's going to go to 14 or 15 percent. So I think it's something that that will manage through. Um, and I think historically, like you were saying, it's not the, the shock is the surprise and the severity and how quickly it happened. And then we're just going to have to adapt and, and live with it like interest rates. Uh, I would say the number one issue that we are struggling with right now is labor. Um, you know, the supply chain is still an issue in certain things. Um, um, and um, but labor is is really the biggest challenge. Just finding to get things built um, and finding the, the the right amount of qualified labor is a huge challenge for us um, in terms of getting projects done uh, on time. That's, I'd say that's number one. And then probably uh, on a capital market side, uh, you know, I, I sort of divide my world into two camps. One is that which we're currently building, so labor is the big problem in terms of generating new business. Um, I'd say the capital markets and interest rates are the biggest headwinds. Um, you know, there's just there's a lot of money out there, but I, I, it feels to me like a lot of it's on the sidelines, waiting to see how this is all going to shake out. Great, Tony. How about you? Yeah, I would agree with the a lot of the money on the sidelines. I mean, we hear a lot with uh, people that we that invest in our properties and you know that give us debt for our properties that there's money there, but getting a hold of it has been a challenge. And you know, demonstrating that the way that we've have, have uh, underwritten our investments is gonna still perform in today's challenges of rising interest rates is, has been a challenge. And, that's, and that coupled with, for us, because I kind of agree with the two camps, stuff that we've already started working on, supply chain issues are real and they're hard to manage. And you find yourself having to pre-plan 
for longer lead times on HVAC equipment, doors, frame, and hardware, things of that nature, much more than you have had to in the past. And the time to occupancy for a Fiserv or a Kohl's has been really impacted by that supply chain issue. Simply, not that you can't navigate around it, but simply because you know it's going to take a long time to get it. Jeffrey, even in the industrial space, are you still, I mean, the sentiment was pretty flat in our survey earlier, but are you, are you still feeling the challenges in the capital markets just as well? It's a mixed, it's a, it's a set of mixed signals. It's a mixed bag. A lot of what these gentlemen said are, are true for us as well. Um, the demand seems to be holding strong. Uh, we're watching it closely. We're not sure it will continue as strongly into the first and second quarters. Uh, when demand, consumer demand, I think will reduce a little bit. I do think there will be some layoffs. I don't think it's gloom and doom, but you can understand why a company may slow down their expansion. Now, there's really two camps. There's the, 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 the mega companies, the Amazons and the Walmarts and the Targets, and they're building supply chain capacity for generations, and they don't care if it's a recession or not. And then there's sort of everybody else who is watching and seeing and trying to figure out how to pay for it and how long will it take and what kind of ROI can I get and what else could I do with my capital and right, is it the right place for the people? Um, I do think power, just to reiterate what I said earlier, is an enormous challenge. So I'll put it in the bucket of supply chain, right? It's a supply chain challenge, but it's not the normal stuff that we think about, concrete or, or roofing materials or dock doors or, or even switch gear because that's part of the power problem. But I'm just talking about power supply now, okay? Um, transmissible, long haul, high wattage or high energy power uh, to a substation that can be transformed and consumed nearby. It's at a shortage, and it's not just a Milwaukee or Chicago thing, it's an everywhere thing. And if you haven't heard about it yet, just remember you heard about it here today, you will be hearing about this all year long in 2023 and probably in 2024. The electrification of everything is a thing and the demand for power exceeds our ability to supply it. So I think that's you know, an industrial issue. And then the very last issue is exactly what these guys said about capital markets and the ability uh, to bring your equity together with your debt. I think there's plenty of equity. We just raised a $450 million fund. Um, we're flush with, with cash for projects, for industrial. I'm not sure that the, the construction loans on any, they say the same things to us, right? Oh, it's, yeah, come on, let's talk. Let's have lunch, let's go to a Blackhawks game, right? It's not really there or at terms that you wouldn't accept or in amounts that won't get the project going. So, or with guarantees that we're not prepared to make or whatever the case is, right? So I, I think that's a real constraint for industrial. Uh, Lafayette, from the city's angle, what, what kind of conversations are you having that, are, that feel like real headwinds for some of the developers trying to get projects done? Well, I'm struck by, uh, you mentioned industrial. Um, I'm struck by how important our planning team is to you know being kind of prepared for the the long haul uh, we completed an industrial lands uh, study uh, within the last year or so where we spent a lot of time sort of thinking about what's available in Milwaukee right now what needs to be available in the future do we somehow need to create more industrial space as we're thinking about um, you know uh, you know areas that, that need redevelopment or projects that are coming down how do we lay the groundwork for uh, um, the kinds of things that people are a little bit more bullish on. So while we've got, you know, our, our downtown plan and our Bayview plan, these areas of the city that, you know, sort of spark greater interest, you know, something that, you know, maybe to the to the average resident doesn't seem as exciting, but is crucial to landing the kind of, um, you know, opportunities that we need to continue building up the city uh, is really important to us. So let's stick with... Um Headwinds slash what, what we're seeing in the marketplace that are, that's going to continue to impact us. It, the world's changing really quickly. Is there, uh, is there something that you've heard in the last several weeks, given how fast things are changing, that's really stuck out to you? Something that's been especially uh, interesting? Um, and, and Tony, let's go back to you on this one to start. Yeah, you know, I heard a stat the other day that 25% of all CMBS loans next year are going to be in distress. Um, I actually think that's low. I think it's going to be more than that. I, and, and it's just a staggering amount of money that you realize that, and, and it doesn't mean that these are gonna fail, but it means that the banks are gonna have to come to the table and work things out. You know, your DSCR coverage is gonna be challenged with you know, people underwriting properties at interest rates that were you know, 
Sulfur plus you know, 190, and Sulfur has now moved in the way that we all know that it has, and all of a sudden your debt service coverage is just not what you had underwritten a project two, three, four years ago. And so I, I think it's just a staggering fact that you're gonna realize that you know, for the debt markets to open up a little bit, you're really gonna have to, the banks are gonna have to come to the table and work with developers and, and real estate entrepreneurs to, to make things happen again. Tom, something really interesting you've yeah, been- I, I totally agree, just to follow on with that. And, you know, I was talking to some lenders, oh, I don't know, a couple months ago, and they're, they're saying, you know, the, the problem, big problem they're having besides just the, the re reluctance to lend just because of the uncertainty is the fact that they really depend upon, in the second half, harvesting, harvesting loans in the first half of the year and, and repatriating that capital. And that didn't happen this year, by and large. So there's a lot of capital, or I should say debt, that's that's, you know, that's stuck out there, largely you know, for all sorts of reasons, bid ask, you, you know, all sorts of reasons. And so there's pressure there uh, to unlock unlock that that debt and those loans. And I think the CM investing is a great is a great issue because nobody hedged, right? Everybody got they took the punch bowl away like overnight, and nobody had very few people hedged, and now they're getting crushed uh, on redemptions. But uh, the, the statistic I heard, we have a uh, we're, we're uh, developing a. Uh, headquarters for CIBC in Toronto, and it's the two towers, and they, and the first tower is completed, they're occupying about a million square feet, and they designed the capacity, you know, sort of uh, butts in seats, was 10,000, right? And they're fully back, or largely fully back, and they're putting 12,000 people into that building, right? Because not everybody's there on the same day. So a facility that was designed for 10,000 people now accommodates 12,000 people. So the first question I'm like is, well, where are those other 2,000 people sitting and what does that mean for that real estate? Does that, does that, is that 2,000 people a vacancy? Like, what happens to the real estate that those 2,000 people really no longer need because they're being satisfied? So, you know, you can call that efficiency, you can call that whatever you want to call it, but if, if it's happening to them, it's got to be happening across the country, the globe. So I, I think there's this, call it what you want, shadow vacancy or shadow uh, occupancy that's out there that's not being accounted for. I don't, I don't think, I mean, I think people are just sort of starting to wake up to that. So I think that's going to be a, a big headwind for commercial office. Jeffrey? Yeah, I'm, shy, I'm shaking my head. Yes. You know, you, you nailed that, right? So the statistic I've heard and this is across all metros or all CBDs across America, is that office space is on average 50% vacant. 50%, okay, 50. Why? Well, it's 20% vacant because of the way the leases and the occupancy obligations go. Add on to that another 12 or 13 or 14% of sublease space, and on top of that there's shadow space, space that isn't occupied and it's not being marketed, but it's still empty, okay? And that doesn't even account for work from home, remote work, part-time occupancy, which actually would raise that number up even higher. So what happens to our office spaces and our downtown marketplaces? Something will happen. They will not be ghost towns. They will not be empty forever. I don't know that they'll always be office spaces. So new mixed uses, right? You've got transportation. You've got amenities. You've got cultural attractions. You've, you've got critical mass. Um, there's too many good things happening in a CBD in too many cities around America for that space to go empty forever. I just don't think it will be office space forever. Um, that goes maybe to, to you know, uh, municipalities and their ability to, to, and willingness to rewrite their, their codes and their ordinances to allow different kinds of uses, to think about verticality, the logistics of verticality, how you get stuff up and down. Right in a Willis Tower or in a in a how, how many stories? Forty one stories? Thirty one stories? You're building here? Thirty one. Yeah, I mean, it's, right? It's a really tall building. So verticality is a thing in that building, right? How you get stuff up to the roof and and back down again. So um, I, I do think those are things. The thing I was going to say um, is, is the Infrastructure Investment Jobs Act and the Inflation Recovery Act are both loaded with monetization opportunities in the infra infrastructure space in the job space, um, in the decarbonization, electrification space. And I think on a pure selfish profit motive, which defines many of us without shame, there's no reason we can't do good for the world and make a buck too. There's no, no harm in that in my, in my opinion. Um, 
I think people are going to focus on those areas, and it will be an economic engine in 2023 and 2024 in particular, while many other sectors wane or stagnate. You're going to see disproportionate amount of investment in those places because the government is effectively stimulating it and, and to some extent funding it and encouraging it. And there's all kinds of opportunists that are already figuring it out. And it's, you're bringing up a fascinating point, all of you, about office. We're going to circle back to that a little bit because there's some really interesting stories uh, within our city that, that matter from that standpoint. Um, but let's, let's move into a little bit of story time about a, a couple of these projects that you have been working on. Uh, they're known by everybody in town. Uh, they're, they're often uh, part of the skyline in big ways. Uh, so, Tom, we're going to start with you. And we're going to talk about how Heinz came to town with Northwestern Mutual uh, many, many years ago, early uh, 20, 2010, 2012 kind of range, right? Kicked off the new, uh, the new uh, headquarters building downtown. That was completed in 2017. 777, um, right behind that, completed in 2018, uh, really set the market, the top end of the market in terms of luxury housing. Um, a lot of people benefited from that, by the way, in this town, so thank you. Uh, so now you're back with this 30 plus story apartment project. Um, wh what did you learn from those early projects, earlier projects that you're using on this third ward deal? What was, what was kind of the tipping point for pursuing this project with the third ward? Sure, so I, I think prior to come up and uh, working with, with Lafayette and his dad on the headquarters for Northwestern Mutual, I was probably a typical Chicagoan. Uh, sure, I know Milwaukee, I went to a Brewers game five years ago. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and so uh, I just, you know, we were so fortunate to be able to be engaged by Northwestern Mutual on two great projects. Um, so I, I live on the north side of Chicago, and I've, it takes me about an hour to drive here. So I spent five years here every week, almost every week, a couple of days, not the whole week. But I fell in love with Milwaukee, saw what a great, great livable city it is. And I think, you know, as, as I said earlier, I've worked in most, done projects in most Midwestern cities. And the one thing, that, the, the great thing that Milwaukee has that none of these other cities have is it is physically connected to Chicago. And I'm not saying that to praise Chicago, I'm saying it is, someone said it earlier in terms of about being more of a, a mega region, right? And so, you know, Milwaukee has uh, many, if not all, of the problems that Chicago has, but at a much smaller scale, it's a much more livable city, it has all of the cultural aspects of a city like Chicago, but it's just much more livable from my perspective much more livable. And I think Milwaukee will, will continue to be a benefactor of migration from, from, from Chicago. Uh, just people come up, they've realized this is a great city to live in. And if I have to go back to Chicago, it's really easy on the uh, train. I took the Amtrak up last night. It's sold out. Like, I got like one of the last seats. And I know they want to add more lines, but they're fighting with, you know, UP on the freight. Anyway, my point is, is that the tipping point for us was just, was this, this, awakening of what a great city it was right on our border. You know, when I first started driving up here, probably half the land between Lake Forest and, and, and the airport was undeveloped, and now it's mostly filled in, right? It really has connected in uh, physically. And so that was a tipping. So we started looking for projects while we were doing 777. And like you, it just took us a while to find another great project. Tony, I, I, I joked before that you, you won the lottery. <sighs> You worked really hard to get there. Now, the interesting thing is you, you guys came to town uh, and, and, and purchased the old Bonton headquarters back in 2017. Now, at the time, they had, re they had signed a lease uh, to stay there. A year later, they were gone. Um, and you had several hundred thousand square feet of vacant space. And then COVID hit. Oh. So um, <clears throat> when we say that it's probably been a lot of hard work to get here, uh, it's probably an understatement, but it is an incredible story to think that now, look, look at me now, is what you can say, Tony. I'll say it for you. Fiserv's coming downtown to Hub 640. Cole's first you know, uh, market-leading store in the downtown area. Talk to us about how those projects came together. Well, we decided to buy that Bonton building eyes wide open, right? You're looking at a company that was clearly on the decline in an in a industry of retail that you know, had question marks well before COVID hit. And so we bought the building knowing that there was a very high likelihood that we were gonna have a lot of vacancy. Did it happen a little faster than we expected? Yes. But you know, we bought the building with a 57,000 foot floor plate, knowing that we were gonna go out and try to find the five serves of the world, kind of elephant hunt a little bit. 
And knowing that in a city like Milwaukee, there's only one or two of those that hit the market. If you're lucky every year, you know, somebody like Fiserv maybe once a decade. But the, the reality was we invested in that building because we liked the story of West Town. You know, at the time that we did it, the hop wasn't a reality yet. It was coming, you know, the convention center was, you know, something people were talking about, but you had no idea whether it was gonna happen. You know, we knew that the city, the idea of this public and private partnership was real. You can, you can call the city and somebody picks up the phone and talks to you. What a novel idea, right? You can, you can ask questions and you can work together. You know, I've talked to Lafayette over the years many, many times. He doesn't always tell me what I want to hear, but he's there on the other end to be creative and understand how to make it happen. And, you know, we've had some really exciting things happen because of that public-private partnership. And so, you know, it, yes, it was a lot of hard work, but it was a lot of hard work by a lot of different people. We were fortuitous in the sense that a lot of the things that were supposed to happen did. Uh, you know, all of a sudden you're going to go down Michigan Street in Milwaukee and you're going to have We Energies, you're going to have Rexnord, you're going to have Milwaukee Tool, you're going to have, you know, Fiserv, and this is all of a sudden going to be this kind of corporate row of real quality, high credit te uh, tenants. And it's, it's really changing the city as we know it in every way, shape, and form. And you know, one of the things, just to talk about that office occupancy, I mean, it's really about capture and retaining the best talent. It comes back to Tom's comment about labor, just in a different way. Labor is key. And so like this return to office that we're facing has been, you know, we still haven't defined what it is. We know that there has to be office in some capacity. Does it mean everybody's butts in seats every single day? No, but is it a place to collaborate, work together and get things done? Yes. And that commitment by Fiserv to come to this building is really, you know, just a, a, you know, coming in that direction, lending itself to, yes, we have to be in the office. Yes, we have to figure out how to work together. And then the last thing I'll add is this kind of multi-use. Kohl's being in the building was a huge selling point to land Fiserv because it's this energy of the area, right? You have the stores downstairs that you can go to. You have the convention center across the street. You have the investment that the city's going to make in Velar Phillips Plaza. You have all these different things that are coming together to really facilitate that wanting to be in the office, having that energy to be there. Can I just follow on to that real quick? I would say, uh, again, congratulations. This is an amazing story. And if somebody asked me, what is the future of office in Milwaukee? I would say it's adapt, if you want to call it adaptive reuse, right? Look at the two biggest deals that have happened. Fiserv and Milwaukee Tool taking older facilities, reimagining them, repositioning them. And it, you know, and from an, as an apartment developer, right? That's just, that's just gold for us, right? Those are all people that are moving downtown. Some of those people will live in our building. Then those people will go shop in the third ward and, and go to restaurants. And it's this virtuous sustainability. And the thing that's so great to, to us is, again, it's not only these great corporations, but they're, I think they're very stable jobs, right? Stability is as important as job. Everybody wants to talk about new jobs. Well, stability, I mean, I can tell you back in Toronto, you know, look how many people made a, and Amazon. I mean, it was, we, had, we, we lived on that great hyper growth, but now, you know, it's a very volatile, very cyclical. I view those like Fiserv's and the Milwaukee Tools of the world are much, I think, much more stable companies. And it's, it is the lifeblood of the city. We used to say that uh, it's a flight to quality. Tracy mentioned this, flight to quality in office. That can include adaptive reuse, it seems, these days, which is really exciting. You had a follow-up comment to this, too, I Jeff? was just going to say what Tony was describing is sort of that dice concept that I had thrown out there, right? You're different. You put differentiation in the market. It's inspiring, right? People are leasing space there. You've created community, and the people that come there have an experience. And each time they come, the experience is a little bit different. It's not a redundant, commoditized experience. It's true experience. And I think that's why that works so well. I think you're going to have already having great success with it, it sounds like. It's probably worth pointing out how incredible the transformation has been in West Town, in large part to a lot of this. And by the way, Tony, you didn't even mention how the Iron District and is bringing pro soccer and whatnot along right. Michigan Avenue as well. Look out, Chicago. Our Michigan Avenue can be your Michigan Avenue. <laughs> Our Michigan Avenue is in decline, <laughs> like yeah, it or not. I wasn't going to go there, but yeah. So speaking, speaking to this, Lafayette, one of your biggest early wins was Milwaukee Tool. And Ooh, did you thread a needle on that one? Um, but I think it, it really set the tone for, for what you wanted to do at the city. So, you know, opportunity uh, uh, 
we get some good things sometimes. Talk to us a little bit more about that and how that has shaped how you've looked at some of these other wins that it seems like DCD is stacking up. Yeah. Uh, well, th thank you for that. Um, yeah, that, that was, you know, when I look back on the Milwaukee Tool deal, it, it feels like one that got dicey but didn't need to. Um, it, it, there are these things that we look at sometimes that feel like, you know, depending on your perspective, it feels like an obvious win. Um, it, it feels like who, who's going to stand in the way of that? Um, you know, whether it be the Milwaukee tool or whether it be the, the work that we did to ultimately get, you know, unanimous support as well on bringing the RNC here, right? There are things that are good from a business standpoint. Um, you know, for the city and that are going to, to rise a, a lot of boats. Um, but sometimes there are people who feel that um, you, you're just not taking, a, taking enough care of, of the elements that they care most about. And I think the way that the tone that we have been able to set uh, both at DCD and larger, um, you know, in an overarching way under Mayor Johnson's administration is that we are not going to let perfect be the enemy of good. That is, that is going to sustain our work when there's something positive that can occur, something that is going to impact a lot of people, impact the city's coffers, impact you know our, our tax base. Uh, we're going to find a way to get that done, and we're, we're not going to do it by, uh, say, ramming it through, but we're going to do it with mutual respect. We're going we're to listen to what other people's concerns are. We're going to talk to them about where we may be able to make some impact on the things that they care most about in other ways, um, but we're going to find a way to, to get these things done. We're, we're not going to, um, you know, let the fact that everyone doesn't get everything. You know, as Tony said, you know, uh, we're not always going to tell him everything he wants to hear, but we're going to try to find a way to get things done. And I think when people, I'm not telling you guys anything you don't know, when people feel like you really respect what they're saying and you're not just saying, well, what, what you care about doesn't matter. This is what matters. When, when you show that respect to people and you're really committed to being a deal maker, you're going to get a lot of deals done. And, and that's what drives us. I feel like because we have you, Jeffrey, um, and, I, and I didn't prepare him with this question, by the way, so be, be ready. Um, as, as, as somebody who thinks about getting deals done and a futurist, um, we've got to, t and, and someone who specializes in industrial, we've got to talk about the I-94 corridor, and we've got to talk about all this land that Foxconn and those municipalities assembled that's just sitting out there. Looking ahead, do you perceive that we attract another very large company to that space, a la the intel that we seems like we maybe were close to getting, or do you think that that just becomes a, um, a very diversified set of developments from a lot of different people, but that there does create, there is going to be some density of industrial in that space because of what's been created. What do you see? Um, I actually know the property extremely well, and I'm very bullish on what backfills, what Foxconn failed to deliver to your community. Um, the infrastructure's been installed. The highway accessibility and visibility is in place. The amenities are quickly filling in, and you don't have to go far to get them, even if they're not quite on the doorstep yet, but they will be. Um, it could draw both uh, labor from Illinois and from Wisconsin. Uh, it's close to an international airport, an MKE. Um, I think it's a winner of a site uh, for somebody sometime soon. Um, unfortunately, I don't see it being a speculative development for all the reasons that we talked about. Speculative development and the ability to secure a construction loan for three years um, and the ability to retire that loan uh, on speculation is, is a high improbability for a while. So it would have to be a built to suit, an inbound user, maybe like Foxconn, fill in the blank, there's a lots of companies. Um, good or bad, like Foxconn, who could be there. The question mark I have is, will Foxconn interfere with who wants to come there because they do or do not want that company on their doorstep? I have a feeling we might have a panel on this again someday. <laughs> it's a wonderful site. It, it's going to be absorbed uh, sooner rather than later. Let's, let's um, th th thanks for that, Jeffrey. Let's come back to, uh, to office for just a moment. I have a feeling Milwaukee is unique when it comes to uh, office occupancy. So we talked about some of the shadow space. We talked about other headwinds um, with office. Um, and yet, we're seeing things and, uh, like these employment contracts that are coming out in the news. And Lafayette, I'd love to hear you talk a little bit more 
not only about why do we put in some of these, uh, some of these employment requirements of people have to be in butts and seats downtown, um, when trends maybe say that we're going in another direction, but yet it drives, uh, uh, you know, obviously vitality to our downtown. But the companies themselves, I'm guessing, have been pretty open to this, and that might say something about the office market and, and Milwaukee in general. Talk, can you tell us a little bit about these? Yeah, and I would say, um, and I'm probably breaking um, uh, kind of a rule, but when a story dies down, you don't bring it back up. But I'm thinking of uh, when Harley made their announcement uh, a few weeks ago that they were kind of re going to reimagine, you know, what their Milwaukee facility looked like, um, and I think it. Everybody kind of stood at attention and thought, okay, what does that mean? And is that sending a larger signal and, and all that sort of thing? But, I mean, certainly I think what it indicated um, is that there's a diversity of thought uh, on these issues where Harley CEO was saying something that you didn't hear a lot of other CEOs saying, saying that, you know, I see value in working from home. I, I see the benefit of that flexibility and what it means uh, for our employees. Um, and there are other CEOs who are really committed to getting people into those collaborative spaces uh, on, on a regular basis. And I think the, the companies that have made that commitment to us that, yeah, we will have butts and seats, we will have workers, um, you know, downtown, they're, they're not doing that uh, you know, because they're magnanimous. You know, they're doing it because they believe it's valuable for the work that they are trying to get done. And, um, you know, we will continue to have deals where that will be, you know, an element of, um, you know, of, of the ultimate agreement. I wouldn't be surprised if there are some deals where there are uh, companies who say, we, we really value flexibility for our employees over the idea of kind of pressing them into the office. And so, um, you know, I, I think you'll see uh, a diversity of deals in terms of what those look like. Um, there, there's value in certainty of saying that whenever we do a housing deal or whenever we do an office deal, whenever we TIF, here's exactly what the parameters are going to be. But that inflexibility, um, you know, in the long term, that's going to stop more deals from getting done than it will uh, get deals over the hump. So it might be a little bit more heartburn of getting things done. There may be people who come to us and say, why'd you allow that here? But you're, you're making us do this. But every deal is going to be different and we, we have to be willing um, to you know to make some concessions and figure out what works best uh, for a particular deal but li like you said um, you know Milwaukee is bucking some of the trends I, I appreciated uh, the slide earlier in your presentation that showed uh, you know inflation is a global phenomenon right and, and so is um, you know what's happening in terms of return to office these are these, it's not a Milwaukee issue it's it's a national and global issue and ye and, and so where you find value is you see okay look Milwaukee is doing a little better than, than things are happening nationally. And so let's figure out why is that? Why are people, um, you know, coming back? And is it because CEOs are taking a harder line or is it because um, of the livability that we talked about? Is it because, you know, the commute times are better here? It makes a lot more sense. Yeah, I'm going to pop into the office in Milwaukee. It's going to take me 20 minutes to get there versus I'm going to, it's going to take me an hour, an hour and a half to get into work. And then that's my whole day, morning, you know, early evening. Uh, so let's capitalize on what makes Milwaukee special, um, and, and then I think we'll see continued acceleration. I, I, be, I believe that employers, it's not, it's not unanimous across the board, but employers want people back in the office. And as you see a softening of this kind of very strong employee market that it has been for the last three to five years and, and transitioning a little bit back to the employer market, people are going to start to mandate at least some form of return to work. I do not believe it's going to be a five day a week, nine to five, you know, in your desk every day return to work, but it's going to be a return to work nonetheless. And as you start to see that being, you know, coming to reality, we have to be able to be flexible in what that is. And the way that you're offering office space to facilitate that return to work is really the key. Yeah, I, I think the, uh, I'm probably the most optimistic on the return to work, maybe on this this panel, uh, and I think it's it's because we're social beings. I don't, I, you know, we can talk about CEOs, or whatever. I look at our company and all the young people, young. How do I define young? You know, whatever, 35 and under, say, all, they they're the first ones back. They don't want to be in their studio apartments. They they, they crave being in the office. They crave the social interaction and they crave the mentoring and the learning. And the, the, the big problem when the return to office 
from my perspective, is people like me, okay? Because my clients don't care where I am. I can sit in my nice home office. Our kids are all gone. And it, it, it's the senior leadership that has to come back and set that example because my son's a fifth-year law student, you would know, as a, as a, as a, as a lawyer. He, he has to be trained every day. He has to write a brief. He has to have that reviewed. You, you can do it remotely, but it's not the same. And so I think that need to get the older people, need to get back to the office, set the example, have them entering. And so I, I think that's what's going to drive return to office is more, you know, just companies' cultures, companies' sustainability, et cetera. It doesn't, I agree with you, it's, it, it, hybrid is here to stay for sure, right? But I, I think this idea that we're all going to be working from, at home permanently and I, I'm not, I'm, I'm betting the other way. I agree. Shouldn't be lost on us that uh, the commute times in Milwaukee, the livability aspect of that, that how cheap it is maybe to park. I mean, look at us this morning. We have free parking here at a downtown facility for an incredible event. Uh, th these are things that matter in Milwaukee. Jeffrey, any last comments? For uh, are you buying my, my uh, office? office? Or you think I'm... <laughs> no. Sorry. Um, I, I, I agree with some of it. I don't think people will sit at home just because they could, right? Especially the younger crowd. They, they can only afford so much space. Maybe they have a roommate, maybe they just have a studio apartment. They don't want to be there. I, I do agree with that. I'm not convinced they want to go to the office. I think mandates are a, are, are a tall order. They mandated COVID shots, and what was the first thing we didn't want? It's a COVID shot, right? Because it was mandated. Um, I'm not sure employer mandates work. In fact, Twitter could be in bankruptcy this week or next week because Elon has mandated that you'll work harder and longer or you won't work here at all. And there is a mass exodus out the door uh, at Twitter as a result. So I think it starts with the collaboration with the different demographics and really understanding the Gen Zs in particular, asking them what would get them back to the office. I think mentorship is a thing that happens in person. I do believe the magic, whatever the magic is, does happen at the office space. So there's some elements of it that are, are totally legit. I think most office space has to be amenitized in a way that it's never been before, starting with health and going on from there, okay? And number two, by the way, health includes mental health, which probably the elephant in the room, nobody wants to address, but it's real, especially coming out of COVID, okay? Uh, and I also think the modernization and the digitization of space to attract the knowledge worker of tomorrow is a thing. And we keep building you know, the horse buggy of yesterday rather than the supercharged car tomorrow. Give me office space that represents that, that, that latter remark and you've got a fighting chance. Ask me to move into a 1960s, 70s, 80s building that's been renovated. Probably not. Uh, but you're, you just said magic does happen. It does. In the office. Yeah. That's going to be one of my favorite quotes from today. I think, I think you're right about that. All right, we have a few quick questions, and then, of course, we have uh, some rapid-fire questions to end the day. Uh, first question, if interest rates continue to rise, will you take lower returns over the next 12 to 24 months, or do you plan to sit on the sidelines? Uh, I think you're going to have to take some lower returns, but I think you're not you're going to see a slowdown of new investments until until there's at least some clarity into you know the forward yield curve is starting to mellow out a little bit you know is it going to dip is it going to flatten you know most believe it's just going to flatten and then maybe dip a little little bit but you know that's right yeah so i think you're going to see until you start to get some clarity in that you're going to see a slowdown of investments sounds like less competition though which is not a bad thing tom um yeah, so I think there's another way of looking. I agree with what you're saying. I think um, uh, it, this is the 1% of me that's a futurist, so please pay attention. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, no, I, I think now is the time. I mean, so every time we go into these economic dis dislocations, for whatever the reason, whether it's COVID or the tech bubble or whatever, it's huge opportunity, right? So unless you're sitting on a ton of cash right now, cash is king. But if you're not sitting on a ton of cash and you rely on the debt markets, like I think we all do, we all do. then I would spend, you know, what are you going to do in 2023? I'm going to be looking for the next opportunity, not trying to recycle what I've done before, but what is the new opportunity, right? Because I'll have some time on my hands and I'll be thinking about what what is the opportunity that's going to be created by this dislocation? That should be, that's my goal for 2023, not trying to figure out, well, when's, what's inflation going to peak at or when's the Fed going to stop rising rates and all that kind of stuff and try and build my business around 
some kind of projection. I think this is, there's huge opportunities in all of our industries. We just need to take the time to slow down and go out and find them because this dislocation will create opportunities. I don't care what food group you're in. Jeffrey. Um, I think for CRG, we're going to the sidelines simply as a means of pivoting to something different and not because it's the sidelines. The real answer is whose money is it, right? Is it my money? Is it someone else's money? If you're cash, you're going to be active. If you're family office, if right, this is your time to shine right now. If you're, if you're preserving capital for the long term <clears throat> and, and, and distressed assets, uh, and you were right about the CMBS, right, and those start to come back, <clears throat> you're going to see a lot of, of activity there. But that isn't us. It's certainly not CRG. Um, we can't build speculatively, like I talked about earlier. Um, and that's fed our organization very, very well for several years. And so many of our colleagues and competitors as well, we're sort of all in that same boat. We are, uh, we just hired, uh, you all saw maybe that Pro Law just purchased Duke, right? Large REIT, buy, also buying a large REIT. Um, we uh, hired a very senior acquisitions team from Duke uh, less than 30 days ago. Go Blue uh, Devils. What's that? Said, Go Blue Devils. There you go. And you mentioned it, Duke, <laughs> yeah. Uh, at any rate, um, they're going to, we're raising a fund, which is the sidelines. That's going to take us all the fourth quarter, all of the first quarter. Um, and that fund will be a core, core plus fund. We've never owned cash flowing existing assets. We're hiring asset management in-house, which is something we've never had before. Uh, and the fee streams from those fully leased properties, which should, should be able to secure some amount of debt, right? Some ratio of, of equity to debt. Um, those fees should cover our overhead until a more speculative marketplace can return. Will we do build to suits in the meantime? Sure. Uh, we're targeting manufacturing because Clayco builds the best manufacturing in the world, and it's something we have the luxury of being able to do when our competitors can't. Uh, but generally speaking, I think it's this core, core plus fund pivot that will keep us from having to lay anybody off. And we have a wonderful team. It's why the magic does happen at the office. We like each other. We enjoy being together. Um, nobody wants to see anybody go. We just got them in the door. We don't want them going out the door right now. But we have to be able to pay them. And that's the pivot. So it's a sideline to, to, to pivot, not a sideline to be on the sideline. So you also answered <clears throat> one or two other questions that came in, by the way, with that mm -hmm. statement about speculative industrial. So thank you for that. So um, we're, 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 we're Wait, Andy, you're not going to ask me what the city's going to do with all of our surplus money that's sitting around? <laughs> Would you like to no, answer your own question? <clears throat> uh, rapid fire questions, one to two word answers. Let's go. Uh, first, and we're going we're to start with you, Jeffrey. We're going to move down the line. Okay. Um, will the CRE market in 2023 perform better than most people think, worse than most people think, or about the same? Better. Okay. I'm optimistic. About the same. Okay. About the same. Better. Yeah, two optimists. <laughs> I'll say glass half full, 50%. What's going to be the bigger challenge for companies in 2023? We're going to start with you on this one, Lafayette. Labor supply or continued supply chain issues? In 2023, um, let me say labor supply. Okay. I think uh, continued supply chain issues for 23. Okay. Labor. Supply chain. Okay. So what happens first, um, and uh, we're going to start with you on this one, uh, Jeffrey. What happens first, interest rates fall or the Bucks win another championship? <laughs> Gosh. Um, I'm going to go with interest rates Ball. No offense to the Bucks. I'm a fan. I just don't really follow the NBA enough to know what their prospects are for this year. Right. Tom? Neither. <laughs> <clears throat> I'm going Bucks all the way. Thank you. Answering to the home crowd. I knew we get a, a couple Bucks. Um, and then um, we're going to start with you on this, this final one as well, Jeffrey. True or false? Commissioner Crump looks pretty darn good for a father of a newborn. <laughs> true. Very true. True. <laughs> You haven't seen me up close. <laughs> Please join me in thanking our panelists for being here today.